Welcome to Champion Life Center's YouTube channel. You are listening to the messages from our Guelph and Cambridge satellite. We hope you enjoy this message by Napoleon Lumise. Please come and join us for our worship celebrations happening every Sunday, 3.30 p.m. at 55 Devere Drive, Guelph, Ontario. See you then. I want to title today, Circumcised for Destiny. And obviously, I am not talking about physical circumcision anymore. And we're going to look through Scripture and try to glean from it some lessons that we can apply to our lives today. Because I believe it is one of the key um, lessons that we can apply in our lives if we are ever going to see all the promises that God has for us in our lives. And so going back to Israel, they cross over, and the very first place that they they had stopped was a place, it wasn't yet named Gilgal. The name Gilgal came about after the fact that they were all, all the men were circumcised there. And so they, they came to this place, and before they could go any further, remember that there was a promise that God had given them, a land, a physical land that God said was yours. But there were many obstacles along the way. There were, there were giants along the way. There was Jericho along the way. There were many things that would hold them and, and, and try to oppose the will of God and the promise of God for their lives all along the way. And I wanna, I'm here to tell us that if we are going to pursue and if we're going to, to possess the promise of God has for our lives, if, if we're really going to be serious about, I want my destiny in God to be fulfilled, we're going to have to learn to buckle our seatbelts and learn how to fight because there's going to be much opposition. There's going to be much resistance against us as we learn, as we read through Scripture. Of, of the enemy trying to hinder us because the, the thing that he, he desires in our lives is that we would live but, not we, but that we would not thrive. That we would simply exist but not truly live. It's okay. The enemy is okay with us just living the everyday life and just going on through life as long as we don't as long as we don't discover that there is something greater in our lives, that our lives were meant for greater things than just going to work, making money, going to church, and that's it, and, and repeat. And, and, you know, there's greater things that we're called to do. And so there's this idea that when they cross over into Canaan, into the promised land, the first thing that God does with them is circumcise them. Joshua chapter 5. I don't know how loud it is out there, but... It, is it? I'm finding it a little loud on my side. That's okay. As long as it's okay on that side. Joshua chapter 5, verse 2 to 5. It says, At that time the Lord told Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the second generation of Israelites. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the entire male population of Israel at Gibeah Haraloth. Joshua had to circumcise them because all the men who were old enough to fight in the battle when they left Egypt had died in the wilderness. Those who left Egypt had all been circumcised, but none of those born after the exodus during the years in the wilderness had been circumcised. Verse 7 to 8, So Joshua circumcised their sons, those who had grown up to take their father's places, for they had not been circumcised on the way to the promised land. After all the males had been circumcised, they rested in the camp until they were healed. I want to bring our attention to that last statement. After all the males had been circumcised, they rested in the camp until they were healed. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And I just trust that you will speak through me, that you will use me today to bless your church, your people. That at the end of our time together, Lord, that there would just be a resolve in our hearts to not be runners, to not run from the dealings of God. Help us, Lord, to see the bigger picture, that you are circumcising our hearts, our attitudes, our mindsets, because of a promise, because destiny is at stake. The promise of God is at stake in our lives. And so, Father, today, I pray that you would arrest every heart, open every ear, open every, every, every mind right now. 
and I just hide behind your cross today. Let the name of Jesus be glorified and let your church be strengthened in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, here was the first stop was on the way to the promise, to the fulfillment of the promise, was a place of circumcision. The first generation that had been delivered from Israel, that generation died off in the wilderness because of unbelief. They believed the bad report of the ten spies and they all perished in the wilderness because in order for us to ever reach and to grab a hold of God's promise for us, it takes faith. And so God had to wait until the old generation died in order for Israel to continue on to the promise. The promise will never change. The destiny, the, if God says so, it is so. It is not going to change. He's not going to change his mind. The players might change, but his destiny, his, what he said was going to come to pass, will not change. And so he had to wait for this old generation, a, a faithless generation, to die off. And only Caleb and Joshua were able, from their generation, to cross over into the promised land. And the first thing that they had to do was to undergo circumcision. Again, this is not about physical circumcision. But there are some similarities that we can, that we can take and, and look into that apply spiritually. I was thinking about it during worship. And the Lord just reminded me that in, in the physical circumcision, it is the, most sen the flesh is cut off to expose the most sensitive part in the, in, in, the, in the male anatomy. Flesh is taken off to expose the sensitive areas of the male anatomy. And I'm reminded of how our lives are circumcised by God. We are corrected by God. God sends correction. God sends rebuke. God sends teaching. God sends leaders among, alongside of us to, to cut off the fleshly, carnal areas of our lives so that we would learn to be sensitive to the voice of God. Our relationship with God is not meant, was never designed to be rules of do's and don'ts. It's not even designed to function off of principles. I love the principles of God, the sowing and reaping, uh, the, the partnering with God to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I love, don't get me wrong, I love the principles of God, but our, our walk with him was never designed to be off of principles. It was always designed to be in the presence of God. That's why in the Old Testament, you see them walking through the wilderness and you see the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. They were camping around the presence of God. All of Israel, all throughout their history, they, there was always the Ark of the Covenant which represented the presence, the manifested presence of God. And everybody, the whole nation would camp around the presence of God. Our lives are circumcised, our hearts are circumcised so that we would learn to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The scripture says that those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons and daughters of God. And so our lives is not meant to just be led by a book and some letters in it. it was, it's supposed to be led by the presence of God that will enable us to understand the book. There's nothing wrong with the principles. But we cannot replace the presence with principles. <laughs> Let me just say that again. We can't replace the presence of God in our lives, the voice of the Holy Spirit in us, with mere principles, scriptural as they may be. What do I mean by that? Paul the Apostle lived off, he knew the voice of God, he'd been called by God, and he knew what to do. He had a desire in his heart as an apostle to go and preach the gospel. But we see in the book of Acts how scripture says that he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go into this region to preach the gospel. Principle was good. Go and preach the gospel. Go and share the gospel. But how many of us know that the voice of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit will trump principles that we know? I, I, I love the principle. The voice and the leading of the Holy Spirit will never contradict the principle. And that's what I'm saying is we need our hearts 
Our hearts are circumcised to make us sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. We live by the voice. We live off of principles when the presence isn't there. But as much as we can, we try to live a people that is led by the Spirit of God. In the same way that my relationship with my wife is not led by a marital uh, book. We, uh, how many of you have that? Uh, we, you know, we, we did premarital counseling and, and we have materials that we bring people through. And these are the points that we need to remember. Communication, conflict resolution. Uh, th there are things that, there are principles that we teach and we, we, we try to go by in order for us to have a healthy marriage. But how many of you know that we're not, I'm not sitting at home reading through the book and trying to go through, check off the checklist. Why? Because I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive to the needs and the desires and the wants of my spouse. It's not just, okay, February 14, I have to buy flowers. <laughs> December, I have to buy Christmas gift. December 29. I forgot it's our anniversary. <laughs> well, see, those are principles. Those are good. You, you, you understand? But there are times I would be doing my other full-time job at home in the kitchen washing dishes. And I would hear my family. My, I would hear Happy and, and, and Sam and, and Anna. They'd be talking. And I would hear her say, oh, I wish I had, I wish I had this. How many of you know that it's not principle that I go by when I go to the mall and get her a watch because I heard the desire of my wife. I'm, li I'm living in a place because this relationship is not based off of legalistic principles where you only get gifts on Christmas, anniversary. Right? <laughs> Pedro, you heard that. <laughs> but it is living a life where you are sensitive what are the desires? It's the same way with our children. I'm not having to wait. I, I don't, you can ask my children. This. I love to provide for them. I love to give them. But it's not out of a procedure. It's not out of a principle that as a father I need to be a provider. When I see my son going through his, his closet, one shirt after another after another, he doesn't have to say anything, but I sense, I, I, I'm learning to be sensitive, and I see he's going through one shirt after another, and he's changing, and he's throwing it over and getting another shirt. Why? Because it doesn't fit him anymore. <laughs> Why? Because it's now, it's been a month since that was bought, and it doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> I don't need for him to say, Daddy, I don't have any more clothes that fit. <laughs> I'm living sensitive. I'm not just living by principle because if it was by principle, then it's only when they come to me. It's only when I can afford to do so. But because of I'm living in sensitivity to their need, I'm able to provide and I'm able to work in this relationship not just by principle but by presence. In the same way, our walk with God I walk with, not just God, He is that. But our walk with the Father. Our walk with the Bridegroom. Because the church is called the Bride of Christ. Our walk with Him is not this mandatory, I have to go to church because it's Sunday. It's, I want to be there. Because I want, I want, I love to be in the presence of God. Nobody has to tell me. Everybody would agree that we love Jesus. We love the Lord. Born again for you. Hallelujah. We love Jesus. We love Jesus. How many of you would believe me if I said, oh, I love my family. I love my wife, but I never go home. How many of, us would, how many of you would believe me and say, oh, you got, you, I love happy. Then how come you're never home? How come you never spend time with your wife? How come you never spend time with your children? <laughs> I'm just being practical right now. I'm being real. Because people say, oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I don't have time for. You, you understand? Our actions speak louder than our words. Right? Now, it's not, it, it's not a condemnation. I'm not talking about people. 
I'm not saying you call in sick. <laughs> you know what I mean? There are people, you, there are people that do have to work. And that's, that's okay. That's legitimate. Go for it. You're, you're expressing your worship to God while you're at work. That's fine. But if it's just apple picking, if it's just because it's a nice day or, you know, whatever this and whatever that, we, need, we, we, we can actually take a look at what we spend time on the most and that will reveal what we really love the most. Whatever you've invested the most into reveals what you love most. Whether it's you've invested your money, whether you've invested your time, whether you've invested whatever it is reveals what is most important to us. And so here, Joshua circumcises all the Israelite men because circumcision is, an, is a mark, like I said last time, is a mark of covenant. It's much like what we know of today when we come to the altar and we take these rings as a sign of my, what? Love. And we slide the ring. It's the mark. That's why you, you got to, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. <laughs> Everybody, some of the guys like hiding their hand in the pocket. Like, oh. But th this is the mark. And this is the mark of what? This is a mark of covenant. This is the mark that says, I can't go with you, girl, because I'm taken. <laughs> this is a mark. This tells the world that I am in relationship. I am committed. I, I, I'm, I'm one with somebody else, and that somebody else is not you. Right. Right. In the same way in the Old Testament, when they were circumcised, it was the marking of God in their lives that they are his own special possession, that they are his own people. That they're not to be like everybody else. That, that when, they are, when they were circumcised, they were brought into a covenant with God. Much like a, a marriage is a covenant where everything that Happy had becomes mine. And everything I have becomes hers. Even my last name is transferred to hers. And, and, and the two shall become one. And we become, her enemies become my enemies. And my enemies become her enemies. And my strength becomes her strength. And her strength becomes my strength. And this, this two coming together in covenant becomes a strengthened union in the same way that when God says, you need to cut covenant with me and this, this circumcision is a mark of covenant, we become one with God where Every, uh, where the resources of heaven becomes yours, you become children of God, you become adopted into his family, your enemy becomes his enemy, and what he doesn't like, we start not to like. When I speak of covenant, when a man is, is circumcised in covenant with God, in a patriarchal society, the whole family becomes part of that covenant. And so, in case there are people wondering, what about women? They're, they're, no, when, when a patriarch, when a father of the house gives himself in covenant with God, everything that is under his covering, his children, his spouse, his, his, even his slaves, his servants, everything that is under him becomes part of the covenant with God. And so they were taught, they were cut with covenant. And this circumcision is a cutting off of the flesh, cutting off of our old selves. They come into they cross the Jordan River and God begins to cut off. It symbolizes when we become born again. When we give our lives to the Lord and we say, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. He is my God. The moment we become born again, that's when circumcision begins to take place. That's when the Holy Spirit comes and begins to expose in us our our. our tendency for gossip, our tendency for cheating, our tendency for lying, our tendency for greed and our selfishness. This process of circumcision begins to take place where we become, where we become uh, uh, revealed to our own selves, where our hearts become uh, open to us, where we become aware of the things that we do that is not pleasing to God. And so this process of, of circumcision is a process of purification. We cannot run away from it. You cannot go any further. You cannot face the, the Jerichos, the walled cities. You cannot go and possess land. And you cannot go and, and name it and claim it and not be willing to go through the process of circumcision. 
this idea of being cut in the flesh, this idea of being shaped and molded into who you're supposed to be is actually the process that prepares you for the promise. There is no shortcut to all that God has for you. Everybody wants shortcut. Everybody wants minute rice. Not me. Everybody wants microwave this and, and, and everybody, you know, drive through that. But that's not so with God. We're never going to be, we're never going to be able to do all that he designed and desired for us to do and accomplish all that we, he's, he's, he's destined us to accomplish if we're not willing to go through some of the cutting away of our flesh. Each one of us has a destiny. I know that for some, that's a, that's, that, that may be a, a struggle to believe. You were a dream of God wrapped in flesh. He had a destiny in mind for each one of us. For some, it may be to be a doctor, a doctor that will find the cure for cancer. For some, it may be to become a governmental leader to lead a nation. For some, it may be an educator to mold and influence the next and the future generations. For some, it may not be as grand as some of the ones that have been mentioned. It may be a stay-at-home mother. You see, we think that just because what God has designed and, and created us for is not as grand as the others, that we think that it's, in, it's not as significant. It could be a stay-at-home mother who is always supportive and the greatest cheerleader of their children. A famous Pablo once said, my mother said to me, if you become a soldier, you'll be a general. If you become a monk, you'll end up as the pope. Instead, I, become, I became a painter, and I wound up as a Picasso. Pablo, Pablo Picasso said that about his mom. You see, sometimes we think that it's about us, but what if our lives existed to propel the next generation? What if our lives today, here and now, existed to position our children to become the world shakers, to become the ones that will heal AIDS one day, to, to, be, to be the ones to lead a, a, a nation. Their lives is just as significant as the others. Or maybe it's a third grade dropout father who worked as a simple cook. But through his hard work, dedication, and pursuit of excellence, inspired one of his sons to become a superior court judge in Washington, D.C., and another son to succeed in earning four degrees on the way to becoming an ordained minister by the name of Dr. Rick Rigsby. How many of you saw that on Facebook? It was trending on YouTube. The African-American man who said, the wisest man I ever met was my father who was a third grade dropout. If you listen to that, it's powerful. The wisest man, he said, I've ever... And this third grade dropout who worked as a simple cook inspired the next generation to be judges, to be these brilliant men who are now shaping and shaking history. So we need, we need the circumcisions in our lives because we are not yet who we, we're not, we've not yet become who we need to be. There is a journey that we are going on in order for us to fulfill destiny. I'm reminded of Joseph, who was given a promise at the age of 15, 16, 14 to 16 years old to become this man of great authority, wherein his parents and his brothers would have to bow down to him. But imagine all the journey of circumcision, of having been betrayed by his own brothers, thrown in a pit, sold to the Ishmaelites. And you have to remember, the Ishmaelites were enemies of the Israelites. They were of the line of Ishmael. Sold into slavery, sent to Potiphar's house to work as a slave from this man, from this young man who was his father's favorite, to becoming this slave in Egypt, falsely accused, thrown into prison, having to serve the prison, 
What was all of that? What was, what was happening in his life? It was called circumcision. It was called the cutting away of the flesh so that he would be the man that he would become, that he needed to become when he became the, the, the prime minister of Egypt, the second most powerful man in all of the world. All of those breakings and all of those betrayals and all of those times to not get bitter but to get better position him so that when his brothers came, he would not seek vengeance upon them. But he ended up saving his brothers. He ended up saving his father. He ended up saving a whole generation where they, that generation prospered. Think about Moses, who was taken away from his biological family as a baby, raised up in and pomp and, 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 and palaces and gold and servants and and. and because he tried to fulfill his destiny in his own strength, he tried to deliver Israelites, he ended up killing instead of delivering. And because of that, he is sent to the backside of the desert where he encountered God working as a shepherd. Imagine from a prince to a shepherd. What was happening in all of this journey of, of seeming like I've arrived, I'm next in line to I'm a nobody, nobody knows my name, I'm in the backside, I'm running away and, and my life is in danger encountering God and being propelled again. All of this is the shaving away of the flesh, of the carnal, of learning to die to our own preferences and saying, God, if this be your will, so be it. Think about David. Ministering to the sheep, being anointed king, next king of Israel. And the one that he was following after, he comes, he's called in because Saul was, 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 demon, he was oppressed with, with demons and he was, all of these things were happening in his life. And he calls for David and David begins to play in the anointing with his instrument and, and the tormenting spirits would leave Saul and he would come back to his right mind and he would serve Saul. He went to battle for Saul. He risked his life for Saul and yet Saul takes a spear and makes him into a target practice. So much so that he's been anointed king but yet he has to run from the throne. And from there he becomes, eventually becomes a king but his own flesh and blood, Absalom, comes and tries to take the kingdom away from him tries to kill him. He's got multiple sons that tried to wrestle the kingdom away from him, and yet he never lifted his hand to, to harm his sons, but rather ran away to preserve the life of his son. He didn't want to have to protect himself. He decided he was going to let God take care of him. So David had to learn to die to his own desire to just let me get him back. Die to, you know, that part of us that wants to just one time just to die to that. All of these things is a process of dying to oneself, of our preferences, our attitudes, our trying to prefer ourselves over others. Selfishness, greed, fear of man. All of these things that we go through is what the Lord would call circumcision of the flesh. And these circumcisions of the flesh doesn't just happen through the word of God. God brings people along to do it for him. And if there's anything that I really want to hammer down on today, it's this. When you're cut, do not run. Can you say that with me? When I'm cut, when I'm bleeding, when I'm in pain, I will not run. I will stay, I will rest, and I will be healed, and I will be better. You see, the problem with so many of our, so many in Christianity today is they, they're looking for people that would tickle their ears. We're not called to tickle people's ears. We're not called to just preach a message that is about me and how I can become, you know, how I can become prosperous and how I can become wealthy and how I can become better looking and, and people will love me. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to make disciples of all nations. We're called, Jesus says, come follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. It is called to a life of sacrifice. It's called to a life of selflessness. It's called to a life that will prefer the kingdom of God and the desires and the plans 
sacrifice and the divine agenda of God over our own agenda and over our own plans, if we had our way, would, how many of us would honestly choose to be where we're at right now? But we're, we are where we are right now because we know we've been called by God to do what we're called to do right now. And we want to be faithful to what God has called us to do. And so people will look for uh, people that, you know, that will tickle their ears and just tell them how great they are. But the truth of the matter is that's not what we're called to do. And so when, 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 when discipline comes in, when correction comes in, you see people running. And the reason why we, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to back down from messages like this because we, we believe that God is raising up a people that are mature, that are, that are, that have been circumcised in their hearts, that have set aside the things of the flesh. This is how maturity happens. It's through training. It's through teaching. It's through correcting. It's through rebuking. And my prayer is that we would not be a people that run but we would be a people that understand that this circumcision is for a purpose of destiny. The problem with running away when God deals with us is that God is faithful. And wherever you go, wherever we go, we will always run into the same issues, no matter where you go. And so let's not run when the Lord begins to deal with us. I need to get moving here. So let's allow, number one, let's allow our friends to correct us. Have a group of friends, have a group of trusted people that you, will, that you know who are for you. Find yourselves a group of two or three people that you know is in this race with you because they believe that you've been called to greater things and they want to be, they want to see you fulfill your destiny in God and they will be willing to come against your will even if you get offended with them. They're going to tell you the truth. We need those are true friends. Not be afraid to be politically correct and not be afraid to offend us. I'm glad we're, see, uh, Happy and I are glad that we have people now that are able to speak the truth in love. And what they see in our lives when, when, when there are things that they're not, they don't believe is, it, that could be better. Let's just put it that way. We do have those people that are able to speak to us, and we're able to speak into their lives. Why? Because we're pulling each other up. Why? Because we're believing in each other that they are called for a great purpose. And, and some of the ideas and some of the attitudes and, and some of the mindsets are not in line, is not going to get them to their destiny. Therefore, as a true friend, I need to come in and say, listen, this has to be changed. Can you just say amen to that? Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. You're not going to grow up on your own. None of us, will, no one will ever come to maturity without the assistance of anyone else. If you leave a child to be by itself, to raise itself up, he may be 30, 40 years old, but they will still act childish. They need the parents to come in and instruct and instill and teach and equip. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. We need to find friends that would gather around us and say, I believe in what God has called you to do. That's what we try to do with our young people. We sit them down. What is your vision? We do it with Ryan. We do it with Janelle. We do it with Brian. Or we sit them down one-on-one -on -one as a father. To, to, we, we, we treat them as our own sons. What do you see? What, what does your heart burn for? Happy is now doing one-on-one -on -one mentoring with, with Angel. Why? Because we believe in, in the destiny that God has for them. And we want to do our part to, to bring them into alignment with that so that they will fulfill their purpose for their generation. That their days would not be wasted on, on meaningless things and, 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 and silly pursuits with, with, with nothing to, to show for. Let's live our lives with, with, with purpose in mind. And so we call our young people and we say, what is your vision? Then why are you doing that? That's what friends do. 
You can ask our, our young people are very open to it, and that's what we do. Then if this is your vision, then why are you taking this route? If you have a certain destination, you know which road will take you there. If you don't have any destination, any road will take you there. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Secondly, let your parents align you. Obviously, this is talking more for our young people now. Let your parents align you. Luke chapter 2, 41 52. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started to come home. They started, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up at the evening, they started looking for him among the relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious leaders, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been, frantically, have been frantic searching for you everywhere. But why, did you, but why did you need to search? He asked. Didn't you know that I, must, that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and with all the people. Parents come. Where have you been? We're looking for you. Jesus says, oh, why are you looking for me? Don't you know I need to be in church? I need to be in my father's house. Jesus loved the church. I'm going to leave that alone. Then he returned with them, verse 51, then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to him. I know that as teenagers, as, as, you know, this may be awkward because most of our teenagers are now in college and they're in their schools right now, so there's only a couple of, of you here. But don't think I'm talking about you, <laughs> okay? I know that teenagers think they know everything. We're, we're now starting to um, experience some of that. I try to deal with it as quickly as I can before I need to start naming him Google instead of Sam. They're coming to that age where they know everything. You, you, you're not even finished saying any, you're not even finished your statement and you already hear, I know. <laughs> I'm not even, I don't even know what I'm going to tell you yet, yet you know. <laughs> I'm going to start calling you Google from now on. See, we think we know, and, and that's when we begin to get in trouble, is when we think we know. There is wisdom in the guidance of our parents. There is wisdom in, 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 in the instruction of the parents. That's why uh, uh, um, Solomon said, Do not forsake the teachings of your, of your, the instructions of your father, nor the teachings of your mother. There is wisdom in listening to those who have gone before us. And it's modeled to us even by Jesus himself where he was the son of God. He is fully God and fully man, but yet to show us the way to life, he himself submitted to his earthly parents, the ones that he would have to one day save from their sin, but yet he showed us the way to life, and that is through listening and submitting to those that are above us. And so for all of our young people, I want you to grow up with wisdom. I want you to be mature beyond your years. We believe that you, God has called you to do great things, but you're not going to get there if you think you can do it on your own. You need the wisdom of your parents. Jesus, if Jesus had to do it, I guarantee you, you do too. We do too. Didn't you know, he said, then he grew in wisdom in stature, in favor with God, and all the people. Something is released when we learn obedience to those who've gone before us. When we understand submission to authority, there's a protection that happens there. There's a flow of the anointing. There's a flow of blessing. There's a flow of grace when we are under covering. 
And that aspect of, of Christianity is so under attack right now because everybody wants to be their own person and, and nobody wants to submit to nobody. But yet, scripturally, Jesus showed us if you want the way to life, growing in wisdom, growing in stature, if you want to grow in favor with God and with people, learn to submit to your parents. And for the next 18 years, Jesus submitted himself to Mary and Joseph until the time that he was to be revealed as the Messiah. Let your friends correct you. Let your parents align you. And lastly, let the word of God circumcise you. Job 5.17 says, Behold, happy is the man who God corrects. Can you say that with me? Happy is the man whom God corrects. You don't sound convinced. <laughs> Happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. The greatest growth in my own personal life, the greatest times of change that I can remember in my, in my Christian walk has been times where my spiritual father sat me down and started telling me, Nap, you can't do that. The greatest, I remember one specific time where he sat me down and said, son, your sarcasm is offending a lot of people. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I grew up in Canada. I'm, <laughs> there are things that we are, that we're doing that we're not even aware of. When he said to me, son, your sarcasm is hurting a lot of people. My response honestly was like, who, Me? <laughs> Even my, even my response was sarcastic. I've been doing it so much that I'm not aware that I'm doing it until somebody had to come in and say, you can't do that. This is what's happening. This is the fruit of, of that action. This is the fruit of, of that behavior. And you're beginning to see the pattern of it. The greatest times of change in my life, I am so thankful for those who have fathered me and, and mentored me. And those are, are moments that I will never forget because I will never be where I am now if they hadn't come in and showed me the areas of my life that was not Christ-like. We need circumcision of our hearts. We need to allow the Lord to speak to us when he speaks to us in the silence of the night, when we're reading our, the word of God, and he begins to show us certain things. Receive it. Be happy. Be glad that somebody cares enough about you and the destiny that God has for you that they've come to show you what could possibly derail you. Hebrews 12, 5 to 8. We're about to close. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as, fathers, as, as father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. If there's anything, an attitude that I want us to receive and to have today, when we are corrected, let's get happy. It's so opposite to the way of the world. The way of the world, if you get corrected, who cares? Who, who, is, who does he think he is? That's why we got people jumping from one job to another, never really happy was talking to her, 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 her boss, and she said one of the greatest lack in today's generation, in today's society, is loyalty. It's so hard to find somebody that has been there for at least five years because after the third up to the fifth year, they're, they're, they use the three to five years as a, as a, as a uh, uh, stepping stone. Every opportunity is never a place to serve and give your life to. Rather, they look at it as a place to, what's the next step? In the same way that companies are, there's no loyalty from the company to the employees, yet there's no, empl there's no loyalty from the employees to the company. 
loyalty and, and, and not running away when things get hard, that's what covenant means. You understand covenant. God doesn't run off on us when we turn our backs on him. He says, even if you are unfaithful, I will be faithful because God is a God of covenant. See, when we don't understand these principles, then we carry over the world, world's way of if you don't please me anymore, I'll go find somebody else that will. If I'm not happy with you, it's about me, me, me. So people come into a marriage about me, me, me. If you don't make me feel happy, if you don't make me feel this, if you, and in the same way, the other one's saying the same thing, and the moment something happens, they go their own way. But covenant is this. Whether you make me happy or you don't, I'm here for you. Covenant is this. Whether you want me or not, you got me. <laughs> That's what's modeled to us by the Father. Even when you're not faithful, I will be faithful to you. The prodigal son's father, he, he runs away, but yet the prodigal, the, the, the father remained looking into the horizon for one day his son is going to come home. That's covenant. Let us not run. I so strongly believe in this message. That we will not be able to do all that we're called to do. We're not going to be able to accomplish all that we're called to accomplish if we don't learn to stay put when we're circumcised. When we don't learn to receive correction. And, and here's the thing. All of the things that we're talking about, all correction and all, it's all done in love. And it's really not about the one that's doing the correcting. We get nothing. The ones doing the correcting get nothing. It doesn't benefit. There's no joy in the one doing the correcting. All the benefit lies in part of, in, in the hands of the one that is being, that, that is receiving correction. And so we undergo circumcision of our hearts, our attitudes, our mindsets. Because the Father is molding us and shaping us to become the person fit for the promise. It's not all in vain. There's a reason to the correction. He circumcises us to mold us and shape us to become the person fit for the promise. Proverbs 12.1 and we close with this verse. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. But whoever hates correction, that's in the Bible? I think that's, no, that's got to be a typo. You know, I looked through all the different translations, and they all said the same thing. Stupid. <laughs> it's in the Bible. And you know who said that? The wisest man who walked the earth besides Jesus, Solomon. I wonder if he became that wise and he walked with such wisdom because he understood these things. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. I thank God that this church is filled with smart people <laughs> who love correction, who will not run, who will not run when they're being circumcised. <laughs> Let's pray.